and let's get started. So I'm going to assume everyone can still see my math on the screen, even though I minimized the Chrome window of our meet. But if that's wrong, someone shout at me. Um, so today you'll notice I have 16 screens. Um, that's, no, that's more than we've been doing. So there are some things I already pre-populated that I'll walk you through, but because of time, I'm worried we would run out. So um, I'm gonna try and go through this stuff relatively quickly. Some, some are quick to get through though. Um, so we're segueing into our next topic, which is actually like an introductory topic to calculus for those of you who end up going into calculus. Um, so we're done with our identities stuff, although they may still come up, but um, they probably won't. So over the next three weeks, I think the only thing we'll be working on is this new material. Um, so first thing I wanna do is looking at these two patterns, I just want us to talk about what's happening in these um, sequences or series of numbers. So in this first one, where we have one followed by one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second. Does anyone want to pop on the mic and talk to us about what the pattern is that you see? Um, the first one is taking half of the previous answer. That's true. So every number in the first sequence is half as large as the one that came before it. The question I have there is if that sequence of numbers goes beyond 164th and continues forever as the ellipses show, where would that sequence of numbers be leading us to? Is there a value that we go towards, in other words? Again, someone can pop on the mic. If you can talk to me about whether those numbers go to negative 50, for instance, do they converge to some other value? Do they not converge at all? Um, I think it's going towards zero, but never reaching it because it's becoming a smaller and smaller fraction. Absolutely. So for the first. Yes. Thank you. So that first sequence of numbers is getting smaller and it's getting infinitely smaller. So let me back on that. But although it's decreasing forever without ever stopping, there is a boundary at which we would never reach. And that's zero, like whoever that one person just was. So this sequence of numbers gets infinitely smaller going towards zero. So we can never take half of the previous number so many times that we'll eventually hit zero, right? What about the second one? Negative zero, negative one half, negative two thirds, negative three fourths, negative four fifths, et cetera. What observation can we make about that one? Is the sequence going towards the number one? Is this sequence of number going towards the number one? What do other people think? To negative one. Negative. Well, ne yeah, negative one, that's what I meant. Yeah, good. So the negatives in front, our fractions are getting smaller, or if we disregard the negative, they're increasing negatively but they're increasing in a way that they would never increase to hit one, or in this case, since we're going in the negative direction, they will never hit negative one. I still don't know what that doorbell means. It could just mean someone popped in. That's what I'm gonna assume. So if you have a question, just shout out at the mic, cause I'm gonna ignore the chat if that's what that notification is. Um, for the first um, trend, uh, you said they would never get to zero, right? So would it, get less than zero, but never have like zero as a value within the data set, or it would just never get less than zero? It can never hit zero and it can't go beyond zero either because we right. can't take half of a positive number and then magically become negative. So we're never okay. gonna hit the negatives either. Okay, so this idea here is kind of 
discussing the convergence of a series of numbers to a certain value, if one exists. And the topic of that, as you'll see in the title of this thing, is limits. Okay, so limits are a big deal in calculus. So that's what we're going to spend the last three weeks of our learning on is limits. Limits of functions, limits of sequence of numbers, that kind of thing. So I have kind of a mathy definition here, but I'll talk about it more when I show a picture because it may make more sense there. But let's say we have some function f of x and we are getting really close to some number as our x values approach some other number that I'm calling c. So if our x values go towards c, that c could be a four, that c could be a negative seven, whatever the number is. Our, as our x values go to some number, and if our function, the y values of our function similarly approach some number, which I'm calling L, and it does so from the left and the right side of that number C, then we say that function F has a limit of L as X approaches C. So again, I know that's probably very confusing without the actual numbers in a picture. Um, let me first write out in notation what those words mean. So the limit, which we write with LIM, lowercase l to start, so it shouldn't be a capital. So the limit of some function, which here is f of x, as my x value goes towards some number, which here I'm calling c, but again, that just represents a number. If the limit exists, then we say it equals that capital L, which is representing our y value where the function is approaching, okay? So again, this math symbol here, or the symbols, says the limit of function f of x as the x values reach the value of c is equal to l. That's what the words above mean. And when we were talking about a limit or the sequence of numbers approaching something but never reaching, what topic does that remind you of when you're thinking about a graph of functions ever since you've been in Algebra 2? If you're approaching something but never reaching it, what vocabulary word? Exponential. So their exponential functions do have a place where a limit exists. That's true. Asymptote. Asymptote. Asymptotes. Right. So that's the more broad idea that I was wanting to get you guys to think about. So asymptotes were regions or values or places on a graph where your function was approaching a number but never reaching it. That's what the idea of a limit is. So you guys have actually been working on limits anytime you had an asymptote. You just never really knew it. So to recall a vertical and horizontal asymptote case, and this function h of x on the right is an exponential function that I graphed. So to whoever was talking about that, let's talk about these limits here. For the one on the left, for the vertical asymptote, in our function, as our x values get really close to zero, meaning we're coming closer and closer and closer to x being zero from the right hand side, we travel on our curve down, 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 down. We keep traveling down as our x values get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller towards zero. Those y values get increasingly large in the negative direction, but because we're going down forever, we never actually are reaching a certain value. In other words, as our x values approach zero, from the positive direction, our y values decrease without boundary. And so there is no limit. The limit does not exist, okay? And the way I would write that in math symbols would be to write, if this is function g, I can say the limit of function g of x as x approaches zero. And if you approach zero, you can approach from two different sides. There's approaching from the left side of zero, which would be me coming in from the left side, the negative numbers. Or you can approach zero from the right-hand side, which is approaching from the positive direction. For this function and the asymptote I'm defining, we're approaching from the right-hand side. And the way we note that with limits is to say x approaches zero with a superscript of a plus symbol. That means x is approaching zero from the right-hand side. If we were approaching from the left-hand side instead, hopefully it's not a big leap to assume that a lot of you would swap out this plus symbol with a negative, and that would be right. Okay, so the superscripts of a plus and a minus mean coming from the right-hand side if it's a plus, or coming from the left-hand side if it's a minus. 
If neither plus or minus were indicated, it means zero from both sides. But in this function for g of x, the function doesn't exist on the negative side for x values, so that one doesn't pertain. So in what I was writing, so far I have the limit of my function g of x as x approaches zero from the right-hand side of zero. And here, since my y values go down forever without ever reaching on a value, we say the limit does not exist. And we usually just abbreviate that with a DNE, does not exist. And there are different reasons why a limit wouldn't exist. And I'm gonna go over that on the next page. And for this particular case, the limit doesn't exist because we're decreasing without bound. And the way that we express that is to put negative infinity, okay? In other words, we are going down forever. For our horizontal situation here, h of x, the asymptote I see is a horizontal asymptote. And here, our curve is going down forever. But although we're going down forever like the other one, we're actually settling on reaching 0, just never, um, never hitting 0. So here's one of the cases where although both of them are decreasing forever, the horizontal asymptote is decreasing, but actually has a, has a boundary. And that boundary is 0. So in this case, our x values aren't approaching 0. Our x values are going to the left forever meaning that our x values are approaching negative infinity. We're going down for x values forever. So with this one, if I was talking about the asymptote, I could define that as the limit of function h of x as my x values go to negative infinity. And here, since this limit does exist because we're going towards the y value 0, my answer is just 0. Are there any questions about this page? So all vertical asymptotes should have limits that don't exist if you're approaching that vertical asymptote because you're either going down or up forever and that doesn't converge on a y value. But horizontal asymptotes actually do settle towards reaching a y value and so those limits do exist. And in the case of this particular one, uh, the limit of h of x as x approaches negative infinity would be zero. I'm going to move this page. So talking about when a limit doesn't exist, and I wonder how many of you are thinking about Mean Girls and Lindsay Lohan. There are Exactly. Yeah, it happens. Normally I would play the clip, but I figure you guys can watch that on your own time if you're interested. So there are three different cases when a limit does not exist. So the one I talked about on the previous page is case number one. When your function increases going up forever, or decreases going down forever without any boundary, and we're going towards negative or positive infinity here in this example for x, then your limit doesn't exist because your y values go up forever without ever stopping, or your y values go down forever without ever settling on some value. For case number two, a limit can only exist when you approach some x value from both sides and you equal the same value for that y value that you're approaching. So I made a piecewise function for this example, g of x. And you see part of the piecewise function in the, is this curve, and the other part is this horizontal piece. So here, if I was talking about what's happening as x goes to negative 2, well then from the left side of negative 2, I'm on the curved piece. And if I'm approaching the x value negative 2 on that curved piece, my y values are going towards 0. So hence, for this one, x approaching negative 2 from the left is 0. That's defined. If I was talking about coming to negative 2 from the right side, then I'd be on the horizontal ray. And if I was approaching negative 2 coming from those positive values into the negative side, then I'm going towards this open circle. And this open circle has a y value here of 3. So from the right-hand side of negative 2, my limit is equal to 3. But then that means that my two single-sided limits from the left side and the right side are not equal values. Zero doesn't equal three. So if for the third one, I'm just talking about what happens as x approaches negative two, 
since the limit was an unequal number from both sides of that negative two X value, that says that the limit does not exist. So a limit can only exist if you're approaching the same value for Y as you're coming from both sides of the X value you're approaching. And then the third case, if your function oscillates between values without ever converging on a value. So here I made an example of like the sine function, for instance. Then here, if I wanted to talk about the limit as we go to negative infinity, so if we go to the left forever, then that curve is just going to keep bouncing back and forth between one and negative one as we go to the left forever. And so the curve is oscillating and we would never reach a Y value. Just like if I went towards positive infinity on the right side of the graph, we would go up and down, back and forth, oscillating forever. And so you would never converge on a Y value and therefore the limit does not exist. But be careful because I can define limits for any X value I want. In this case, for example number three, I was going to negative and positive infinity. But that doesn't mean the limit doesn't exist everywhere for the sine function. If I wanted to talk about what's happening as x approaches zero, for instance, so at that origin, as you approach zero from the left-hand side, and as you approach zero from the right-hand side, your limit in both cases, your y value is going towards zero. So here's a case where if I want to talk about the limit as x approaches zero of function h of x, that limit does exist and is zero because our y values are going to zero. So I don't want you guys to be confused and think that any time you have an oscillating function, your limit automatically doesn't exist. It depends on what your x value is approaching. Is there any question about that or anything else on this page? Okay, so those are the three examples or the three cases when limits don't exist. Okay, and I'll let, let it be on you to figure out based on what was showing in Lindsay Lohan's question in the movie, which case that might have been. Um, so I'm gonna move on. So now there are four kind of general ways to evaluate limits. We're gonna start simple today, just talking about graphing and direct substitution. So the first two methods. So graphing is just looking at a graph and being able to track with your eyes kind of where your Y values are going, depending on where you're going for X. So that's pretty simple, I think. Hopefully it'll be simple for you when we do a bunch of examples in a moment. Direct substitution is actually taking the function equation you were given and just plug in the value of C that you're approaching for X, plug it into the equation, evaluate the um, expression you have, and whatever you get out is what your limit should equal. So that also should be simple because you're just plugging in a number into an, ex an expression or an equation, which you guys are used to doing. Inspection is a little bit more difficult. It's a little bit like mental math. Um, we're not going to talk about that today. That'll be next week. Um, but that's basically talking your way through figuring out the function's behavior as you approach something without actually needing to see a picture or without actually knowing the equation um, for the function itself. And then what I have here just generally as other algebraic methods, that means we're gonna use algebra to manipulate some equation we're given when direct substitution fails to a point where we'd simplify some stuff in the equation and get it to a point where direct substitution won't fail. So we'll be doing um, that next week as well. So we're gonna focus on graphing and direct substitution. So to focus on graphing, I have a bunch of examples here. So looking at the graph of f of x in this picture, this is clearly a piecewise function, three different pieces I see, two that are just constants and one that is a solitary point, also a constant at a single value for x. So I have six different things I want us to evaluate here with this picture. For a, evaluating the limit of our function as x approaches three from the left-hand side. So we see on our graph that our x value here is three. So if I want to figure out the limit as X approaches three from the left, I'm on this piece on the left side and I'm going closer and closer and closer to that X value of three from the left side of three. And those Y values as I'm approaching three from the left hand side are approaching what number? Someone pop on the mic and give us the answer for that. Mm 
what is the y value as our x values are getting closer and closer to three from the left hand side of three? Negative one. Negative one, exactly. Okay, all of that constant line has a y value of negative one. So as we get closer and closer to x equals three, we're still just on negative one. Similarly, for b, the limit of the function as x approaches three from the right hand side, well, this time I'm coming closer and closer to x equals three, but I have to go to three from the right hand side of three. And as we get closer and closer to three from the right, our y value here is just always three. So the limit here is three. For C, we're not talking about the left-hand side or the right-hand side, we're talking about both. In other words, the limit of the function as X approaches three from any direction. Well, here, since the left side limit was negative one and the right side limit was three and negative one does not equal three, this is an example where the limit does not exist. And I would indicate left and right-hand limits are unequal. Any question about that? What if it was exponential? Well, so let's let's see if I have an example of that. But if it was exponential, there's only one direction you can approach. Well, let me go back a second. So in this example here, this was an exponential function. Okay, if I'm talking about the limit as x approaches negative one, for instance, well, coming from both sides, you are equaling the same number. So the limit as x approaches negative one would be whatever this y value was here. But again, you can define limits wherever you want. If I'm talking about the limit as x approaches negative infinity, well then here, there's only one way you can go to negative infinity and the limit here we're seeing we're converging on zero. So it depends on what you're talking about where you're approaching for that c value for x. So back to our example here, evaluating for D, this isn't a limit, this is simply asking what's the, uh, the function value for Y when our input value for X is three. Well, in our picture, when X equals three, we're at this single point here that has a Y value of one. So this isn't a limit, this is just indicating that at X equals three, our Y value is one. For E, the limit of the function as X goes to negative infinity, well, this is us moving along the curve as X gets smaller and smaller and smaller to negative infinity. So we're going to the left forever. And here, that Y value is always negative one, no matter how small you go for X. So that limit is negative one. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, when you were for, for C, if the y values were an equal distance from that point in the middle, would it still be like whatever that answer is right there? What does that mean? Yeah. yeah. So if what you're saying is if that um, constant on the bottom, instead of being negative one, if it was down at like negative three, for instance, then for A, we would have had negative three. For B, we still would have had three. And for C, we still would have had does not exist because the limit is not the same number from the left and the right hand side. Okay, thank you. Yep, good question. So for F here, the limit as we approach positive infinity for X means we're traveling to the right forever. Sorry, this pink and the red are not looking good together. So as I travel to the right forever, X getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that constant here is always on three. So the limit there is three. So I have a bunch more examples like this. Let me do one more and then I'll start taking other, other answers from people for the third one. So let's look at this picture. Here's function g of x, same kind of setup. I've asked for different things I want us to evaluate. 
So for A, evaluating the limit of our function as x approaches positive 4 from the left-hand side. So we have 4 here coming in from the left of 4, meaning value smaller than 4, but getting closer and closer and closer. As we come in towards 4, we see we're going towards a y value of 1. For B, as you approach 4 but from the right-hand side of 4, then now I'm coming in from bigger numbers towards 4, but again, we see that our y values are getting closer and closer and closer to positive 1. That also is 1. And so for C, when asked in general what the limit of the function is as you approach 4 from any side of 4, meaning from both sides of 4, here that limit actually does exist, unlike the last one, because your left-hand limit was 1, your right-hand limit was 1, and so your limit in general as you approach 4 is also equal to 1. For D, again, not a limit, but simply asking what is the function's y value when your x value is 4? Well, we do see that we have a defined point here when x is 4, y is 1, so that also is equal to 1. For E, as you approach negative infinity, that means we're going for x values getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and because of that arrow, we're going down forever meaning our y values decrease without boundary, never reaching a value. So for E, we have that the limit does not exist, and the reason is because we're decreasing without bound, meaning we can just write negative infinity. For F, as X approaches positive infinity, meaning our X values are getting larger and larger and larger, we're going forever up on the graph, and again, if we're increasing without boundary, that means our limit does not exist. But this time, it's a positive infinity because we're going up without ever converging on a y value. Any questions about any of these? OK, so. Here I want different people to pop on the mic as I ask the questions and see how we're doing on understanding this stuff so far. So here's function capital F of X. Looks like an absolute value function, but with a point removed at negative two and plotted up here at negative two, three. So this perhaps is a piecewise function. For A, the limit of the function as X approaches negative two from the left-hand side of two. So as we approach negative two from the left-hand side of two, can someone come on the mic and tell me if a limit exists and if so, what the value is? Yes, um, zero. Zero is correct, if that was William. Yes, we're approaching zero for y as we approach negative two from the left. Someone else, if we're for b approaching negative two from the right-hand side, does a limit exist and what is the value, if so? Zero. Zero is also correct. For C, the limit in general as x approaches negative 2 means from the left and the right, if a limit exists, it has to be the same number. We already evaluated a and b and got zero. So for C, that should just be zero. Now notice, even though there's a hole at negative 2, the limit still exists as you approach negative two because your y values are still getting closer and closer and closer to zero. So as far as limits goes, your function doesn't have to exist or there could be a, a discontinuity at that x value, but the limit could still exist, okay? For D, the function's y value when x is negative two, someone else, that answer should be? Three. Positive three, yes, because we have that point up here at negative two, three, which means when x equals two, y equals three. Someone else for E, the limit as x approaches negative infinity, so we're going smaller and smaller and smaller for x values, going to the left forever. What is my answer there? Does 
Don't be shy. Limit doesn't exist. Limit doesn't exist. Um, negative infinity. So the limit doesn't exist is correct. It's not negative infinity though because our y values are going up. Oh yeah, positive. Right, so the reason would be we're increasing without bound. Thank you. And similarly for the last one, as x approaches positive infinity, that means we're getting bigger for x values. We also see our y values are getting bigger forever. So we have another does not exist case, but because we're going positive forever. Here function phi of theta or phi of theta, depending on who you're asking. Normally when it's a function, we say phi of theta, even though in the alphabet it could be phi, Greek letters, lowercase phi, lowercase phi of x. Here we have something that has some asymptotes involved. So the limit of phi of x, as x approaches negative two from the left, so if I'm drawing this for myself on the picture, which you can do for homework if you need to, here we're going down forever without ever converging on a y value. So we have the limit does not exist. And I should indicate a reason. And here the reason is because we're going down forever, negative infinity. For B, the limit of x approaching negative two from the right hand side. This is us going up forever on our function without ever converging on a y value. So here we also have that the limit does not exist, but the reason this time is because we're increasing without boundary. So we note that with positive infinity. For C, the limit as x approaches negative two from both directions, well, the limit didn't exist on the left side and the limit, limit didn't exist on the right side. So all I needed was one of them not existing for us knowing that the limit doesn't exist for C as well. And for this, I'm just gonna indicate positive and negative infinity, meaning we're either going up forever or we're going down forever. And in this case, we're doing both depending on which side we're working on. Now, if both of those one-handed limits were the same, meaning instead of the first one being negative infinity, it was going up forever, even if they both were going up forever, the limit still would not exist because going up forever means doesn't exist. So if anyone was wondering if, um, if they both were the same reasons for not existing, if that would change the answer for C, the answer would be no. So once the limit doesn't exist, it doesn't exist, okay? No matter what the reason is. For D, being asked to evaluate the function when x is negative two, we have a vertical asymptote on negative two, meaning there is no y value when our x value is negative two. In other words, our function is undefined when our x value is negative two. For E, the limit as x approaches negative infinity, that means we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller for x. We're going to the left forever, in other words. And here, we see that our x values are getting smaller, but our y values are getting bigger. But there is a boundary to how big they can be, and they can only ever reach two without, sorry, they can only approach two without ever reaching. So here, the limit exists, and it's two. Our y values are getting bigger towards two, as our x values are getting smaller infinitely. For the last one, as x approaches positive infinity, that means we're traveling to the right forever on our graph. And here, as we go forever to the right, our y values are getting closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, meaning that our limit exists and our limit is equal to zero. Questions on this page? I have a question Go ahead. about um, why the purple is undefined. Right, so the purple is saying, what is the y value on your function when x equals negative two? 
Let me just write that out. Because of that vertical asymptote at negative two, our function never reaches negative two. There is no point anywhere when x is negative two. In other words, the function is undefined for that single x value because of that vertical asymptote. There's no place where our curve actually has the x value of negative two. Does that help? I got a question. Go ahead. Why can't we put um like brackets and parentheses like we did when we did the um, um when we were writing like domain and range? With the, uh, so we're not being asked. For the, we're not being asked for the domain and range here, though. We're just being asked. I know. For the, About saying like the brackets and like we wouldn't use that here. You don't need to use that here because we're not being asked for all of the y values or all of the x values. We're being asked, does, does your function's behavior reach a y value? It's not asking for all of the y values that are possible. Okay. How is C determined? Say that again. How was C determined? C was determined because all I need to know is that a limit doesn't exist on either the left-hand side or the right-hand side for the limit to not exist in general. So the limits, single-sided limits didn't exist. So obviously the limit in general doesn't exist. If the limits for A and B did exist, how would that, but they were different numbers, how would that change C? C, which if the limits for A and B existed, but were different numbers, then my answer for C would still be does not exist, but instead of me writing positive, negative infinity, I would have written that the left and right hand limits are not the same. All right, thanks. So when you guys go to do your first term homework of the week, you have a lot of these pictures, obviously different pictures. So if you put DNE does not exist, you also have to give me the reason. So that's where the reason is either negative infinity or it's positive infinity or on this one back here, for C, the limit didn't exist, and I wrote that the left and right hand limits were not the same. So you should always put a reason. Every year I get homeworks where people just put DNE, but you have to show me that you understand why it's DNE. Okay, so make sure you're either putting positive or negative infinity, or left and right hand limits aren't the same, or oscillation will be another case, um, that kind of thing. So this next one, function f of x again, and it seems like people are shy of volunteering. So because of time, I guess I'm just going to go through these myself. Thank you for those of you who were picking up the mic to volunteer, though. But shout out if you have questions, of course. Here for A, the limit as x approaches 3 from the left. So I'm coming in from the left side of 3, and I see that I'm going down forever. So my limit does not exist. And the reason is negative infinity, decreasing without bound. For B, as you're approaching three from the right-hand side, similarly, we're going down forever for our Y values. So our limit does not exist because we are decreasing without bound. For C, the limit of the function as X approaches three without a direction specified means from both directions, but from both directions, our limit didn't exist and we were going down forever. So our limit still doesn't exist, and the reason is still that we're going down forever. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, when you say, for A and B, when you say that the limit doesn't exist, how is that different from saying it's undefined? Um, it's not really. I mean, it's the same idea. We normally talk about a function being undefined, but a limit not existing. So it's just kind of the way we talk about it in math, but the idea is the same. So if you wrote undefined, I guess I would take it, but since I'm demonstrating it to you with a does not exist instead, that's really what you should be putting. The limit doesn't, doesn't exist. Whereas in this back example here, for the function itself, rather than saying the function does not exist when our x value is negative two, the vocabulary we use is that it's undefined. So functions are either defined or not defined, 
limits either exist or don't exist. But the idea is the same. OK, thank you. For d here, the function when x equals 3, here we see a point at 3, 1. So my y value is 1 when my x value is 3. So here's a case where you see the difference between even though a limit doesn't exist as you approach 3, the value of the function itself does exist when x equals 3. So it doesn't have to be the case that your limit has to be the same thing as your function's value at that x value. Okay, so again, the function exists at x equals 3. It just happens to be that the limit doesn't exist as x approaches 3. For e, as you go to negative infinity, that means we're going to the left forever on our graph. And as you go to the left forever, we see a horizontal asymptote being formed, meaning our y values are converging towards a positive 1. And on the right side of the graph, as x approaches positive infinity, as we travel bigger and bigger and bigger for x, our y values are converging towards the number positive 2 for y. So when it's vertical, you're saying positive and negative. And then when you're going horizontal, you're writing the y value. Right. So a vertical asymptote means your limit never will exist as you reach that x value where the vertical asymptote exists. And it is either be going up forever or down forever or both things would happen. My, my spinny wheel is going. I hope my computer didn't just freeze. No. I seem okay. Um, so for vertical asymptotes, the limit shouldn't exist, and you would just have to indicate what the reason was. For horizontal asymptotes, though, that means you're actually approaching a y value, so you should, you should definitely have an answer. So your homework for Wednesday is a bunch of these kind of examples. And you can write on your picture if you want. That's not what I'm going to evaluate. I'm going to evaluate your answers for each of these things. But if you don't need to, I mean, it's not like you need to. I did that for the sake of hopefully the visual is helping people understand why I was getting the answers I was. So that's all the graphing method, using a graph to figure out if your limit exists, and if so, what y value you're approaching. Next method is direct substitution. Like I said earlier, that just means actually throwing in whatever the x value was that you were approaching into your function's expression, and whatever you get out would be the limit. So I already have these done in the, in the um, interest of time. So for the first one, the limit of x squared as x approaches 4, well, if you plug in 4 for x, 4 squared is just 16. So the limit is 16. For the second one, the limit as t approaches 4, again, if you plug in 4 everywhere you see t, evaluating that stuff would give you a 19, which means if you were looking at a graph of that quadratic, as you approach 4, your graph should be showing you that your y value approaches 19 from both sides of 4. For the third, the limit of y, sorry, the limit of the function when y approaches 4, if you plug in 4, you get 19 over 3. So that's the y value. That's the limit as you approach 4 for that y value. And finally, the limit of 5 as x approaches 4. Well, if your function is defined as 5 everywhere, well, then no matter what you're approaching for x, your y value should always equal 5. So the limit of a constant is just always going to equal that constant no matter where you're approaching. I hope that makes sense. If your function is always equal to 5, then you have a horizontal line at 5 forever. So no matter where you're going for x, in this case 4, well, then your y value is always just going to be 5. Does this um, only work for graphs where there um, is a... Un is no slope or zero slope? Uh, well, no. I mean, the only one here that has a zero slope is the last exa uh, is the last example. All of the other ones have a different slope depending on where you are for x. Oh, cool. Thanks. So this is just some quick examples of plugging numbers in directly. Okay. Um, but a note about that. So here, if I had function f of x equals 3x minus 2, and I asked it to evaluate the limit as x approaches 2, using direct substitution in blue, all I did was plug in 2, and I got 4. 
I just want to show you if we were using the graphing method, well then here is a graph of function f of x, and you do see on the graph as, as you're approaching two from both the left side of two and the right side of two, your y values are converging to that blue dot being four. So here is just kind of validating with direct substitution and with graphing, we are getting that four, but I want us to be careful because graphs can be deceiving or problems can exist in functions. For instance, if I talk about this rational function g of x, well then if we directly substitute, if we're evaluating the limit when x approaches one, plugging in a one would make our denominator zero. One minus one is zero. And we're not allowed to do that. We can't divide by zero. So direct substitution in this example would fail. We wouldn't be able to use it. We could therefore rely on a graphing method and I have the graph of that rational function and because of that denominator being zero when x equals one, there's a hole in the graph, which I put that green open circle. But even though there's a hole with limits, it doesn't matter that a function is defined at an x value. It just matters whether you're approaching a y value at, as you're approaching that x value. So here we see if we graphed it, we'd have a hole, but from both sides of x going to positive one, we have this y value approaching two. And so the limit here is two. But I don't want to always have to graph in order to evaluate a limit when we fail with direct substitution. So if you remember from an earlier page, one of the methods was using other algebraic manipulation. So I have here, we're not going to do these kinds of problems until next week. But if I were evaluating this limit and direct substitution failed and I was trying to do it without graphing, I would just manipulate what I was given algebraically. In other words, in the rational function we have, that cubic in the numerator I was actually able to factor in here in maroon, if you can see, into x minus one times x squared plus one. And once I put that in factored form, the x minus one on top and bottom cancel each other. And once we cancel that denominator, it's no longer creating a problem for us of having a zero denominator when we plug in one. And if you notice here, what I'd be left with is x squared plus one. And if I use direct substitution now, one squared plus one is just two. And that is the limit that we had decided on when we looked at the graph. So when we do problems next week where you have to manipulate the function, that's what I mean by manipulating. It just means taking what you're given and hopefully you can simplify it in a way like I did here by factoring and cancel so that you can plug in the number you were given and direct substitution won't fail. But again, we won't do problems like that until next week. So everything I'm giving you this week will either work out with the graph um, that you can evaluate, or for the direct substitution ones I give you, you should just be able to plug straight in and you have an answer or you know that it doesn't exist for a certain reason. Okay, we're almost done. Um, so properties of limits, these are pretty basic. Um, so properties of limits, the limit of some constant B, no matter what you're approaching for X, is just always gonna equal B. That's like the example from the earlier page of the limit of five as X approaches four. If your input is just a constant number B, well then that's what your limit is gonna be no matter what you're approaching for X. In other words, the limit of a constant is simply equal to that constant, no matter where you're approaching. For the second one, the limit of X as X approaches C, well, this is just direct substitution. If you plug in C for X, you're gonna get C. Just like for the third, if your input is x to the nth power and you plug in c for x, you would get c to the nth power. And the third, the limit of the nth root of x as x approaches c, well, directly substituting c would give you the nth root of c. So that would be your limit. And the only note I'm making here is that since our even indexed radicals can only ever give us um, positive results, that means that our C value has to be greater than zero. If your N value was odd, an odd number like the cube root, that's where you'd be allowed to have negative numbers for C, okay? But so I'm just making that extra note, depending on what the N value was in what you're given, if it was a, uh, an even number, it would have to be a positive value for C or, or zero. Um, I guess I should have put for C is greater than or equal to zero. Oh no, it doesn't have to be zero. N could be a, an odd number and zero would still work. Sorry about that. 
Okay, this page is overwhelming, but I'll hopefully simplify it for you. These are operations with limits. So if you had two different limits and you add them together, for instance, the result should just be the separate limits being added together. So here I put that, let's say we had function f and function g. And let's say function f's limit as you approach c was l, and function g's limit as you approach c was k. As far as scalar multiplication, if I multiply function f of x by some number b and then take the limit, that just equals the limit on its own times that value of b. In other words, whatever the limit was l times b. Sum or difference, if you add or subtract functions together and then take the limit, well, that's just taking the separate limits and then either adding or subtracting them. So it's not quite distribution of this limit as x approaches c, because that's not really, it's an operation. It's not a number we're distributing in, but the outcome kind of looks as though we distributed, even though that's not really what we're doing. For the product, multiplying two functions together and then taking the limit, fortunately for us, we can simply take the separate limits and just multiply them together. Similarly for the quotient here, if you divide two functions and then take the limit, that should give you the same thing as taking the separate limits and dividing them. And I'm only noting here that obviously k cannot equal zero, meaning our limit for g of x can't equal zero, because if it did, we'd be dividing by zero, and that's a troublesome spot for us. And finally, for raising a function to a power and then taking the limit, that's simply equal to the limit raised to whatever that power was. So even though this page looks overwhelming, it's actually some operations with rules that we kind of wish were true and are happy to find that they are true. So I have one more page to do problems that involve this. And there's one or two problems on your first homework like this. But again, this should be really quick and simple because adding just means adding the two limits or multiplying just means multiplying the two limits. So math that you wish were true actually is going to be true here. So here for this first one, a, the limit as x approaches c of negative 2 times function g of x. Well, we were given in the problem that the limit of g of x equals 5 when x approaches c. So here, according to the rule we had on the previous page, this is simply equal to that constant, negative 2, times that individual limit. And we were told the limit was 5, so 5 times negative 2 is just negative 10. For b, the limit of the difference of functions f and g, well, again, because of the previous page, we know the limit of a difference of functions is equal to the difference of the two separate limits. So I can separate the two limits on their own. And then we were given that the limit of f of x was 4 and the limit of g of x was 5, so subtracting those gives negative 1. For the third, the limit of that quotient, we know from the previous page, is simply dividing the two separate limits. And so the two separate limits were 4 divided by 5, so 4 fifths is our answer. And finally, the limit of the square root of f of x, that should simply equal, in the previous page, the property was with an n, a power of n. But remember that a square root just means our n value as an exponent would be 1 half. So this is just like me taking the one half power or the square root of the limit we were given and the limit was four, so the square root of four is two. Here is an example where the square root of four is plus and minus two, but remember the rule we talked about in the past. If the radical symbol was already on the page for you, which it was in this case, we only use the positive. If the radical was something we introduced into the problem, we would have to deal with a plus minus. But here, since it was there already, we only, <clears throat> excuse me, we only assume the positive. So I surprisingly made it just before my clock hits two. So that was an hour class. I know that was a lot, but hopefully with the pictures, which is the bulk of your first homework, it's simple for you just to look at the picture and see what's happening. And for anything that's a direct substitution problem, anything I've given you so far should work out by you just plugging straight in. And for this kind of problem, hopefully these are easy things because the rules that you wish would be true are actually true. So before anyone leaves, let me just grab the attendance for the class. 
and I'll stick around if there are any other questions. Let me stop the recording.